Okay. Welcome everyone to Topos Institute Colloquium. Um, we're really happy today to have Titan A. Bradley uh, talking about entropy as an operad derivation. Take it away, Ty. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all and to be at the Topos Institute, albeit virtually. Um, thanks very much to David for the invitation um, uh, to give a talk today. So um, let me make sure my slides work here. Um, so I'd like to, uh, in the next 50 minutes or so, um, give to you a description of Shannon entropy in the language of operands. Um, now, I, I ended up giving a talk on this work a couple of weeks ago at a, at a venue where um, some of you might, might have been. Um, but I've included some new things. Um, so hopefully, whether you're hearing about this work for the first time or you've already heard about it um, in the past, uh, hopefully there's a little bit something in it for everyone. Um, so let's see, I want to make sure that I can see you all. Okay, great. So I can see faces now. So the outline for the next uh, 50 minutes or so, I want to open with some basic preliminaries. Um, some of it might be kind of standard stuff, but just to get everyone up to speed. Then I will spend some time telling you about this result, this way to think of entropy in terms of a certain operad, which I'll get to later. Um, and then I'd like to wrap up by uh, saying a few words about related works. And I've put a little blue star there because um, you might see in the progression of the talk that uh, from my perspective, the, the work or the punchline is, is actually pretty uh, basic and elementary. But I think what makes this work so interesting is how it kind of fits into this larger context in the realm of category theory, or how it fits into other works that have been going on sort of in the same, same time. And I think that that really what's, what lends to the um, interesting aspects of this result. So that's what the blue star is, and so I'll get to that at the end. But let me just start with some basic, uh, a basic background. So the, the highlight of, of this presentation, of course, is Shannon entropy. Um, which is a number assigned to a finite probability distributions given by this familiar expression. So the sort of expected value of the negative logs of these probabilities. So Shannon entropy, intuitively, we think of it as sort of the amount of uncertainty or surprise that's attached to some event with, with certain probabilities for the different possibilities in that event. In this talk, though, it will be helpful to think of entropy really as a sequence of continuous real valued functions on topological simplices. So, in other words, a probability distribution on n elements um, is a point in a topological simplex, basically by definition. I'm going to use um, sort of a re-index notation for convenience. So for this talk, let's let delta sub n denote the set of all probability distributions on n elements. So the point is that for each one of these distributions, for each n, for each probability distribution in delta n, you get a number called Shannon entropy. But I'd like to think of the totality of, of all of that. So we'll think of Shannon entropy as the sequence of continuous functions on topological simplices valued in the real numbers. Now, um, another little bit of, of preliminary um, information is that this sequence of functions satisfies a very important property that's called the chain rule. So the chain rule essentially tells us how entropy behaves on composite probability distributions, or there's a certain way to compose probabilities. Um, and then the Shane rule kind of says, here how, here, here's what entropy does um, when you compose probabilities in this way. So before I tell you what the chain rule is, I first want to tell you what the sort of algebraic structure of probability distributions is. And pictures will be very helpful. So um, en route to explaining this idea, let's, let's, um, instead of thinking of distributions as sequences of numbers, let's instead think of this, them as, as trees. So if I have you know, a coin toss, there's a 50% chance it lands on, on heads or tails. Let's think of that as a rooted tree with two leaves where each leaf is uh, labeled by one of the probabilities in my distribution. And 
you know, similar, similarly for any distribution in elements. Now, here's the thing, you can imagine tossing a coin and then depending on which face it lands, doing something else with certain probabilities. So in other words, since P has two leaves, it can be composed with two different probability distributions. And how do you do that? You just simply multiply probabilities. So the example that I like to have in mind is, okay, I toss a coin. If it lands on heads, I'll do something which I've colored in blue. Maybe, you know, the example I like to use is like think about breakfast or something. So I toss a coin, it lands on heads with 50% probability. And maybe I think about what to have for breakfast. And I choose three things, you know, with different probabilities like cereal, a fourth, fruit, three quarters, and like a plate of mushrooms with 0% probability for breakfast. Um, or I toss my coin, it lands on tails. And instead I think about something else, you know, dinner. And I have two options for dinner with different probabilities. So in total, then I have five different outcomes and the probabilities for those five different things are obtained by multiplying uh, the probability of the first event, you know, landing heads, and then the probability of the second, choosing, I think, fruit. So for example, this three eighths here is just one half times three fourths. Um, and similarly, I kind of get these probabilities on the right, these five options by sort of propagating up this one half into each of the leaves and then multiplying those numbers. So convenient notation for this probability, this composite probability distribution, we'll just use this circle notation for composition. So P composed with Q and R is precisely this larger distribution on five elements. So that's what I'm saying here. This composition or this sort of elementary multiplication defines a map on topological simplices. So I take a P from delta two, a Q from delta three, and R from delta Q, and I get a new distribution on delta five. I add the leaves. Um, of course, there's nothing special about, about these numbers here. Any probability distribution on N elements can be composed within different distributions in this similar way of kind of multiplying probabilities. So you're kind of composing a bunch of distributions at once simultaneously. Sometimes it's convenient just to do this one at a time. So, you know, I, I flip a coin, it lands on heads, and then that's it. Or maybe I flip a coin, it lands on tails, and then I can think about, you know, my two options for dinner. Sometimes it's just convenient to do this kind of composition partially. So there's notation for that as well. So if I compose a distribution on the second leaf of P, I'll just denote that by P circles two, denoting the second leaf you know, of R. And multiplying in the same way gives a, gives a probability distribution. So the punchline here is however you want to think of it, partial composition or simultaneous composition, um, we have notation for that circle I or, or circle without a subscript. Um, so this is kind of the algebraic structure, this way to multiply, quote unquote, or compose probability distributions to get, to get composite distributions. But this structure also has an identity associated with it, uh, to it. So of course, I can look at the probability distribution on a single element that's just one, and you can see how that serves an, as an identity for this algebraic structure. So if I, you know, toss a coin, um, and then, you know, compose it with this sort of unit, um, my distribution on one element, it doesn't change, right? Whether I compose on the left or the right, one half times one is one half. So, okay, I have this algebraic structure and an identity, and then the punchline, then all of this assembles into an op-rat. So the punchline is that topological simplices, together with these composition maps, this way of composing probability distributions, um, together with some associativity axioms, and, and we have to say what it means to have a unit. Um, all of this forms an operad. Now, I'm kind of assuming that, that this audience is familiar with operad, so I have this little footnote. You know, when I say operad, I mean a one-object multi-category with no symmetric group action. Um, 
If you haven't heard of OPRADS or you're not familiar with them, then it's also fine because this is the only example that we'll need in this talk. So when I say OPRAD, I really just mean this way of composing probability distributions. I toss a coin and then I think of something else to do depending on which face the coin lands. Um, if you're not familiar with OPRADS, I think the an interesting historical note is that even though this example has to do with probabilities, historically OPRADS are really uh, from the world of abstract uh, of algebraic topology. Um, and so what's interesting now is that, well, I've already mentioned to you Shannon entropy. So now OPRADS are appearing in the realm of information theory, even though they have a more topological um, pedigree. Uh, okay, so why did I mention this again? Well, because I wanted to tell you about this chain rule. So the chain rule is, is a rule for how entropy behaves on these composite distributions. And so here it is and this sort of toy example. So, so the point is that when you have this collection of continuous functions defined by Shannon entropy on simplices, well, there's a rule. You can ask, if I have one of these composite probability distributions, you know, can I write the entropy of that in terms of the entropies of the individual distributions? The answer is yes. So the chain rule says the entropy of this, um, probability distributions on five elements, you know, my three breakfast items and my two dinner items, is the entropy of the first option tossing the coin plus a weighted sum of the second two options, you know, my breakfast items or my dinner items, where the weights are just the respective probabilities from, from my first event, tossing the coin. Um, I mean, this follows directly from the definition of standard entropy and properties of logarithm. Um, and then the point is that it's, you know, it holds it in general. So if I have any probability distribution on n elements, P, this tree in black, and I just sort of compose it with different probability distributions, Q1, Q2, up to Qn, the chain rule is this sort of generalized uh, equation here. The entropy of the composite distribution is the entropy of the first, plus a weighted sum of the entropies of the, the, the sort of trees on top that you're composing it with, where the weights are the probabilities from P. Um, if you want to read more about this, I highly recommend Tom Linster's new, relatively new book called Entropy and Diversity, the Axiomatic Approach. I think it came out um, last year, 2021. Um, in, in this book, Tom refers to the chain rule as the most important algebraic property of Shannon entropy. So algebraic is this sort of operatic composition. Why is it the most important? Well, um, so Tom has a theorem, which is that continuity together with the chain rule are enough to characterize Shannon entropy. So the theorem is stated as, as follows. If you have a sequence of functions, on topological simplices valued in the reals, then the following are equivalent. Your functions are continuous and satisfy the chain rule is the same as saying it's equal to entropy up to some constant multiple. So these are enough. So uh, to characterize entropy, the chain rule is sort of, I like to think of it as like the this sort of DNA or fingerprint of Shannon entropy. Um, a little bit of history, which I think may help put some of this in context, um, I mentioned this is, is in his book, Entropy and Diversity. If you want to look at the proof, it's given in theorem 2.5.1. 2 now, if you are a seasoned veteran of the N category cafe, you might remember that 10 or 11 years ago, um, Tom wrote a nice blog post called An Operatic Introduction to Entropy, where he describes the topological simplices as an operat in this way we've just discussed, multiplying probabilities. And he gave a characterization, a different one, not on this slide, of Shannon entropy in the language of operads and in the language of category theory. Now, I'm not going to show you what that characterization is because um, it would take a little bit more time to introduce it. Um, but I mentioned that uh, for those who may be familiar with this line of work, maybe you remember reading, reading that blog post, um, or you can look it up after this talk if you're interested. I have it in the footnote here. 
This is also in his book now, um, Theorem 12.3.1. So different characterization of Shannon entropy in the language of category theory and operads. Now, there's another um, sort of well-known paper around the same time, 2011, by John Baez, Tobias Fritz, and Tom Linster. And they actually give a char another characterization of Shannon entropy in terms of category theory only. So, so you won't find operads in that paper. Um, it's called a characterization of entropy in terms of information loss. I think is, this is like the go-to paper when we think of category theory and entropy in the same sentence. Um, and a little bit of history, um, Tom's operatic characterization uh, served as motivation for this, this other 2011 paper um, that came out by Bias, Frist, and Leinster. Um, sort of simplified it so you won't find the language of operats there. Um, but what kind of connects all of the ideas on this slide is that this theorem on the left is really based on a much earlier characterization in the 1950s by Dmitry Fadayev, which itself is quite similar to Claude Shannon's original characterization of entropy in his seminal 1949 or 48 paper that introduced information theory. So I think it's actually worth saying a little bit more about this. So on the left is Tom's theorem that characterizes entropy. It's sort of a slight variant of this 1950s characterization by Fedaya. So let me show that to you now. So here it is. Um, Fadayev in 1957 gave this characterization. Well, you have now you know, four assumptions. You have a sequence of functions. How do you know if they're entropy? Well, yes, they must be continuous. Okay, he has the chain rule, but there's actually this special case of the chain rule here. Not quite the general one that we've been discussing, but Fadayo says, well, suppose you have an arbitrary probability distribution P and you compose it sort of on the first leaf with a distribution on two elements and then kind of leave the rest alone, compose the rest with identities. Then you have the chain rule in that specific case. And so this is the one that Fadayo considered. Now there's also two other assumptions. Um, you also, he also assumed that the functions are invariant under bijection. So if I permute the probabilities of P, then okay, the value under this function I stays the same. And then there's also this normalizing constraint, which just sort of fixes the base of your log at two. So that's why there's no constant here. Um, but the point is that you can a sort of get rid of this invariant under bijections uh, assumption if you work with the more general version of the chain rule. And so that's what Tom proved in his book on the previous slide. So it's kind of inspired by this characterization of Fadayev. Um, but I mentioned that this itself is quite similar to the original ideas that Shannon was thinking about about 10 years earlier. So let me show you that theorem. I think his paper is quite interesting here. I've massaged it a little bit. If you look at Shannon's original paper, the theorem is not quite stated in this way, um, but in essence, it's the same. I just wanna draw the parallel with Fadayev and Leinster's theorems. But the idea is that Shannon says, well, to characterize entropy, yes, you have continuity again. You have the chain rule, which if you read his description of it, it's essentially this sort of general composition we're talking about. But he also has this assumption about monotonicity. So he, he also assumes, okay, monotonic entropy is monotonic on uniform distributions. That means if your probabilities, your probability distribution is, you know, on n elements, it's one over n for each, for each possibility. As n increases, then the entropy intuitively increases too, because you have more things to choose from. So the sort of uncertainty is greater, or the surprise at the end is greater. So I think kind of look. You know, lining up these three theorems side by side, they, you know, we've kind of pruned the, the um, assumptions over the years, but what remains is that you have continuity in the chain rule, which, which Tom proved. Now, I actually think it's worth taking a look at Shannon's paper, because if you read his description, of the chain rule, you know, right before he states this theorem characterizing entropy, you see this figure six, 
So he, he kind of says, okay, if I have a probability, you know, distribution one half, one half, and then depending on that, I have, you know, two other choices that break up into two options of probabilities, two thirds and one thirds. I mean, this picture is exactly an opera, right? Which is interesting because this is like 20 years before operads officially came on the scene. And when they did, they were not on the scene really in the world of information theory, but rather in algebraic topology. But if you rewind 20 years, you actually see this structure or this picture in Shannon's original paper. So I think now it's, it's nice that it's kind of come back full circle, um, which you can read about again in, in Tom's, Tom's book. Okay, so that's kind of the end of the preliminaries. I just wanted to set the stage introduce entropy and introduce this chain rule. So now what's the, the kind of result that I wanna share or the new idea I wanna talk about now? Um, what I'd like to convince you of now is that this chain rule really from the perspective of operads or this particular composition of topological simplices in this way really is like the product rule. So you can kind of see it, you know, if. I like to say, if you take a step back and squint, this kind of looks like H applied to the product of two things is equal to H of the first plus some action of the first times H of the second. I mean, kind of if you like really squint, it feels a little bit like the product rule or the Leibniz rule from calculus. Um, and in fact, this intuition can be made formal. And so this is now what I wanna, I wanna turn, um, turn to this new topic and describe for you a correspondence between Shannon entropy and what I will call derivations of this operad of simplices, which I'll just denote by Delta. So derivation of course being like a function on topological simplices that satisfies some version of the Leibniz rule. So this is what I want to share with you now, but let me kind of give you the high level, you know, big picture idea. What do I really mean here? So here's the idea. We wish to upgrade entropy, this sequence of functions on simplices valued in the reals. Upgrade that to a sequence of functions, continuous functions, still on simplices, but now valued in something which I will just use like a black box as a placeholder for now. Um, moreover, that satisfies the product rule. So for any probability distribution, P, and another one, Q, no matter which leaf of Q I grafted in to, I want that to be D of the first thing composed with the second plus the first thing composed with D of the second. So that's my picture here. So I want a sequence that satisfies this equation and then that somehow recovers the chain rule. And so that's what I'm gonna describe for you now. This is kind of vague and murky, so I wanna get more precise now. First of all, what do I mean by this black box, this placeholder? For every probability distribution P, I get a what? D of P is what kind of thing? Well, let's let this black box be the space of real valued continuous functions on n-dimensional Euclidean space. So in other words, for each probability distribution in delta n, we will assign to that a continuous function from Rn to R. Now, if I have a sequence of these assignments, moreover, that satisfies this product rule on the left, this is what I'm referring to as a derivation of this operad. Now, this is still kind of murky because I haven't explained how to understand these two terms on the right-hand side. So what is this, this right composition and this left composition? These you know, are supposed to be functions, but what, how should we think of them? So let me give you a very concrete example. How do we think of right composition? D of P composed with Q where Q is a probability distribution and D of P is a function. Let me give you a concrete example of how to think about this expression. Um, suppose P is a probability distribution on two elements. And again, let D of P from R2 to R be a continuous function. 
In principle, you can think of DFP as convex combinations um, or constant at the entropy of P or something else. So I have this continuous function, D of P, and I'm going to draw it as a tree with two leaves. So I think of you know, D of P accepting two inputs from R2, and then you know, the, the value on that is, is one output. Now pick another probability distribution, say on delta three, from delta three. And you know, to be concrete, let's just suppose it's two thirds, one third, and zero. So, so here's a picture of that. Now, if you remember, um, when I kind of compose a tree with three leaves and I graft it onto a tree with two leaves, I'm left with two plus three minus one or four leaves total. So I'm gonna now describe for you a function on R4. Um, let's denote it by D of P composed with Q, but this subscript one, because I'm gonna think of grafting Q as you can see on the first leaf of P. And the R means I'm composing the probability distribution on the right. So what does this function do? Well, it takes an element of R4, X, which has four components, X1 up to X4. Since I'm composing on the first leaf of P, take the first three components of X, X1 up to X3, and just take the com convex combination with Q. So Q is a probability distribution, take the convex combination with this sort of first three coordinates, I get a number, use that number as the first entry for D of P. And then just leave, you know, use X for that last uh, element, just leave it alone. So when I write D P circle one R of Q uh, with Q applied to some uh, value, value X and R four, this is the idea to have in mind. Of course, there's another function here. I could change this subscript to two, and that corresponds to grafting this Q on the second leaf of D of P. And the idea would be the same. I would leave the first entry X1 alone, and then take the convex combination of Q with the latter three. So I use those as my two inputs for D of P, and I get a number. So that's that function. So this is how to think of right composition. It's sort of D of P evaluated at some stuff on the inside. But what about left composition? What if instead of having my probability distribution on the right, it instead appears on the left? So let me describe for you now how to think of this. So again, let's say Q is some probability distribution in delta three. It doesn't really matter what, what it is um, in this example. Again, we get a function from it. Let's, you know, D of Q is on R3, continuous. Again, you can think of this as convex combinations, whatever. Let's again say P is a probability distribution on two elements. And, you know, for concreteness, let's just say it's three fourths and one fourth. So again, I have these pictures. So <clears throat> I'm grafting now these two trees together. The result will be a picture with again, four leaves. So I'm gonna have a function on R4 again. So here's how to think of this example. Suppose I have P and I compose it with this function D of Q on the first leaf of P. Analogously, something similar will hold if I graft it on the second leaf. So here's how to understand this expression. I take some, some input X from R4. What I want to do, since I'm grafting on the first leaf of P, I'm going to apply the function D of Q to the first three entries of this input X. Three because D of Q can only accept three arguments. And I'm going to weight that value by the first probability of P. So again, that's what this subscript one is referring to. Now, what about this last this last coordinate, our x4, we'll just, just throw it away, toss it out. If that doesn't feel, if that feels kind of funny, imagine I have this sort of um, unary function from r to r that's just constant at zero, 
So that's essentially what I'm doing here. I'm composing um, this function that's constant at zero from R to R. I get a number, I, you know, I, I input X4 to that, I get a number zero, I multiply that by one fourth and I add it. So there's an there's a implicit zero over here. So that's what that is. So I have a function, d of q, I input the first three elements, I apply dq, dq to that, and then I scale it by the first probability of p. And similarly, you know, if this subscript was a two, I do the same thing if this picture appeared on the second leaf of p. So that's, 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 that's the example to have in mind when I say left composition that appears in this product rule and similarly for the right composition. So ways to get functions from probability distributions and to compose them in this way. So kind of putting this all together now with these examples in mind, just kind of summarizing what we've just done, for each n greater than one, this sort of black box placeholder now, I'm gonna denote the space of continuous functions from R into R as n sub n of R. So I'm kind of thinking of the, this endomorphism operad. But I want it to be a topological space. So um, you can equip it with a product topology. So the kind of punchline then is that we're interested in sequences of functions on simplices valued in, in this function space, which is also comes equipped with these left and right composition maps. Okay, and in the examples I've just given, you can show that they're continuous with respect to this product topology. So there's a way to take a function, kind of multiply it with a probability distribution and get a function and to do that either on the left or right. And moreover, I want, I want the sequence of functions to satisfy this product rule. So I've given you an example of left and right compositions, but okay, we should have an example of, of an assignment that actually satisfies the product rule here. And um, sort of one of the punchlines is that Shannon Entropy does this. So Shannon Entropy defines one of these sequences. So here's how to do it for each n and for every probability distribution on n elements p, let d of p, one of these functions on Rn, just be constant at Shannon entropy of p. So no matter what the input is, the output is always just Shannon entropy. Then for any other probability distribution, q, and for any input in, oh, this is a typo, this for any x in r raised to the power n plus m minus one, this should really say. Then what is d of p circle i with q? So I have a tree I compose q on any one of the n leaves of p. I get a function associated to it. Well, it's just constant at entropy of that resulting Shannon uh, uh, probability distribution. But by the chain rule, the entropy of P composed with Q is just the entropy of P plus the entropy of Q, but weighted by the ith probability of P. That's the chain rule. But by assumption, the entropy of P is really this right composition applied to our input. So if you remember, when I have um, this function D of P and I'm composing it with a distribution on the right, it's just the function evaluated at you know, some convex combination of this input with Q, but it doesn't matter what that, that input is because it's gonna be constant at entropy. So I just have this DP of some stuff, it doesn't matter what the stuff is, it's just constant at entropy, a uh, constant at P. And sort of similarly, what is this PI, the ith probability of P times the entropy of Q? Well, it's precisely this left composition. Um, you sort of take this ith probability, apply it to D of, of some of the entries in X and kind of the rest go to zero. Doesn't really matter what that entry, that, that input is, because again, D of Q is just assumed to be constant at the entropy of Q. So fine, that was um, sort of a straightforward way to get one of these sequences that we're calling derivations and that follows directly from the chain rule when you define the sequence to be just constant at Shannon entropy. So given entropy, you can get a derivation on this operad of, of simplices. But, um, oh, 
I'm not able to change my slides. Uh, sorry, there's. Okay, good. So, but there's something to say in the other direction as well. So suppose you are given one of these sequences. I have a derivation. Is there a way to sort of get Shannon entropy from one of these derivations? And the answer is yes. And in fact, the statement is that given a derivation, there is a point at which when you evaluate your sequence of functions at that point, then you can recover Shannon entropy. So I'm gonna tell you exactly what I mean. Suppose you have a derivation. Suppose you have one of these sequences and of these, and suppose that they satisfy the product rule. Now, I'm going to define a new sequence of functions valued in the reals now, but also on simplices as follows. So for each probability distribution P, let I of P be equal to, okay, for each P I get a function called DP. And I'm going to evaluate that function at the origin of Rn. So that gives me a number, a real number, and I'm saying let I of P be equal to that number. Then, well, the I are continuous because I'm assuming the D are continuous. And moreover, if I have any number of other probability distributions, Q1 up to Qn, I can compose them and I can ask, what is the value of I on that? Okay, well, by assumption, that's just the function associated to that composite distribution, D of it, evaluated at zero. Now, you can show, I, I won't here, um, because it's essentially just writing down a bunch of stuff and it may not, it might be a little bit boring for me to put it on the slide, but you can show that this function on this composite distribution evaluated at zero is equal to the first function evaluated at zero plus a weighted sum of the other functions evaluated at zero weighted by the probabilities. In other words, this is basically the chain rule, but at the level of these functions. Maybe one way I can say this, anytime you have a derivation or a function that satisfies the product rule and you apply it to not just a product of two things, but a product of more than two, it's essentially just D applied to each of the components. So that's kind of what's going on here, just intuitively. Um, now, there's also a little a caveat here. Each of these zeros on the slide are not the same. So this zero that I'm pointing to right now is the zero in um, Rn, if P is a distribution on N elements, but this zero up here is the origin in R raised to the power, whatever the sum of the lengths of these distributions are. But in each case, it's the zero in higher dimensional Euclidean space. But again, by assumption, um, each of these is just equal to I, I mean, kind of by definition. And so that's precisely the chain rule. So I've defined a sequence of functions that satisfies the chain rule. And by Tom Leinster's theorem, those functions are just Shannon entropy up to some constant. So the punchline here is that whenever I have a probability, a sequence, one of these derivations, a sequence on simplices with this sort of left and right composition, um, there is a point at which they're equal to, to entropy. So you can at least have something to say in that other direction. So Shannon entropy defines a derivation and conversely, there's something you can say there. So this is kind of the, the theorem or the result that I wanted to share, this correspondence between entropy and derivations. And this is just summarizing what I just said in words. So entropy defines a derivation. And for every one of these derivations, there exists a point at which it's given by a constant multiple of entropy. Um, and then what's nice is that the chain rule follows as it, it comes as a corollary of this. So in other words, the, the original chain rule that we know and love. So for each n, take one of the, you know, define a sequence, D, just to be constant at, ent at entropy. 
So D takes a probability distribution, D of P, just let that function be constant at entropy. We already showed that that's a derivation. And if you evaluate it at any point, say X, well, if it's constant at entropy and I have one of these composite distributions, I get the entropy of that composite. And this is again, that claim I'm showing, I, I'm making for you. The derivations actually satisfy their own version of the product rule when you kind of write it out. So I'm not gonna go into detail there. But again, by assumption, because this D of P of whatever the stuff is, is just entropy, you precisely recover the, the usual chain rule because it is satisfied at sort of this function level. Okay, so that's kind of consistent. We started with entropy, we upgraded to a derivation. And moreover, when you have this definition, it sort of recovers the chain rule in this nice way. So if you're interested in these, these details, um, this is in a, in a paper um, that I wrote that came out last year. Um, I will say that this theorem was motivated by a remark that John Baez made in a really nice sort of informal blog post on the NLAB called Entropy as a Functor. So he wrote this article around the time um, that all of these ideas were swooling together, operads and, and category theory and entropy. This is a really great expositional treatment where John is describing all of these ideas and he sort of made the observation that the chain rule feels like the Leibniz rule and he explained Tom Linster's operatic characterization of it and sort of left it as a challenge or as a puzzle to reconcile the two. And so the result I've given you now is sort of in response to that nice article that John wrote. So in this paper, um, it's, it's much more general. So of course, operats can be fine and defined in any symmetric monoidal category, not just topological spaces. These left and right composition maps, really what you have is a bimodule over an operad. So you can make sense of that. And then likewise, this concept of a derivation makes you know, sense being valued in any one of these bimodules. So, so all of this holds it in much more generality. And, and if you're interested, you can, you can um, find the details in the paper. One question though, I mean, kind of the first question that comes to mind is, okay, if I have one of these derivations, Great, I know how it behaves at zero, but what about at points away from zero? And so um, I don't have an answer to that. And maybe if someone is interested, they can think about this and come back later <laughs> and tell us. Um, okay, so to, to wrap up um, in just a few more minutes, I think, so I opened this by saying, fine, you can do this thing, but uh, like who cares? Or why is this interesting? I actually think what makes this interesting is not the details or really this, the statement, but it's the context in which the statement fits. In other words, there are other results where sort of similar ideas are swirling around. And I think that, that um, that's what sort of makes this especially interesting to me. So let me just give you, let me say a few words about, about other results. So I mentioned, if you were to look at Shannon's original paper, you'd see this picture, which is sort of hinting at this operand structure. If you were to flip two pages over, you see Shannon introduced this notion of conditional entropy. So the way Shannon describes it, if I have two possibilities, call them X and Y, and you know, X has certain values, each with different probabilities and same for Y, I, consider a, I can consider a joint probability distribution on these sort of two random variables. So you can make sense of joint entropy. But once you have a joint probability distribution, of course, you can talk about conditional probabilities or conditional entropy. And the point is that the entropy of these joint variables X and Y, Shannon shows here, is the entropy of the first plus, okay, this notation means the conditional entropy. So, you know, how much do you know about Y given that you know something about X? You know, how, how uncertain is your knowledge of Y given that you know something about X? Now, in the literature, this expression is also called the chain rule. And in fact, it is exactly this chain rule that we've been talking about, but just in a special case. So I don't really wanna go through the details on this picture, it's probably too much. But you can imagine I have a joint distribution on X cross Y, if X you know, has two elements and say Y has three. I can just look on probabilities of X alone, but for each element of X, 
I get a probability, a conditional probability distribution on Y. And so since there's two elements in X, I have two different conditional probability distributions on Y. And so I can compose them. And so this statement on the previous slide is the entropy of this sort of composite picture. When you first pick something from X and then pick something from Y given your choice in X. Okay, conditional entropy satisfies this. If you make a little notational adjustment, okay? Um, Sh Shannon used a subscript, but let me kind of use this familiar entropy of Y given X. If you were to instead replace that with, let's say X acting on the entropy of Y, let's introduce this notation, then this formula describing conditional entropy looks like this. Entropy of two things is entropy plus of the first plus the first times or acting on entropy of the second, which looks like a derivation. And in fact, this is precisely this one co-cycle condition in group cohomology, or if you like, um, the terminology for such functions are called cross homomorphisms, which are like derivations, but maybe where you know, the group action on the right is trivial or something. So this analogy to group cohomology was fleshed out in full detail in 2015 by Pierre Badeau and Daniel Benequin. They have a paper called The Homological Nature of Entropy. And in this, in this work, they construct a certain co-chain complex and show that Shannon entropy represents the unique one co-cycle there. So you start with this sort of basic observation about the expression that entropy satisfies and, and lead quite quickly into um, what they call information cohomology. And I think if you think about this, um, it doesn't take too long to sort of see the connection, at least that's consistent with viewing this perspective of viewing entropy as a derivation as well. Okay, but now one is just getting started. So I really like what John Bias said recently um, in, in an event that happened a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, thinking about entropy and sort of these, you know, modern tools of mathematics, you know, whether it's category theory um, or homological algebra or, or operads, um, maybe that's not new, you know, maybe it's 10 years or so, um, but, but I like what John said, there also is a sense in which this subject is just getting started because all of these ideas are kind of swirling together and so one might wonder how are they related. One good place to start, I think if you're interested, so the event I'm referring to is what's called the Categor Categorical Semantics of Entropy. It's a symposium that was hosted at CUNY. Um, the ITS stands for Initiative for the Theoretical Sciences. That was hosted by John Tarilla a couple of weeks ago. There are talks on YouTube um, on some of these results. And I think if you're interested, you, you, should, you should look them up in, in, um, and take a listen. Let me just in the, you know, one minute or so that's remaining, I'll just give you a little sampling so that you can take a, take a deeper look if you're interested. Um, so some, some of the works that were at the symposium and then in addition. So there's lots of other ideas floating around about entropy in sort of this non-traditional way. In this talk, our focus was on operads and specifically the operad of topological simplices. So I mentioned this idea kind of started around 11, 11 years ago with Tom Linster. And I mentioned he wrote, he wrote an article on the In Category Cafe. You can also see that result in his book in a chapter called Entropy as an Internal Algebra. So I won't say more about that. Um, there's another paper that came a year after that that also used the same opera that we talked about today by Matilda uh, Marcoli and Ryan Thorngren, Thermodynamic Semi-Rings. So there they introduced this notion of thermodynamic semi-rings um, as the algebra for a certain opera that's related to the one that we discussed. Um, if you like um, tropical mathematics and algebraic geometry, I would recommend taking a look at that paper. Now there's recently been um, another paper also about entropy, also using operads, but not this, not this opera, a different one. So recently, John Baez, Owen Lynch, and Joe Muller have a paper called Compositional Thermostatics. Um, Owen gave a nice talk at the CUNY Symposium, so you can take a look uh, on, on YouTube. 
but they construct an operad, not this one on simplices, but actually on convex relations, whose algebras are basically what they call thermostatic systems. And so I think this paper is nice because it kind of provides a unifying framework for both thermodynamics, classical statistical mechanics, and quantum statistical mechanics. So kind of a natural question is, okay, another perspective of entropy from the viewpoint of operads, you know, how are these things related? This is just on operads, but you know, you can go on. There's, there's ways to think about entropy from the perspective of category theory. David gave a really nice talk um, at CUNY on viewing Shannon entropy in this category of polynomial functors, which I know you all at Topos Institute know, know so much about. I had the pleasant introduction to it a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can think of category theory and mixing it with quantum physics. So Arthur Parzignat um, has a paper where he essentially generalized this characterization of entropy from Bias, Frist, and Langster, but from the classical to the quantum setting. And he's done a lot of work also with relative entropy. He has a nice talk on YouTube at the same event. You know, you can mix category theory and also quantum, but also homological algebra as we saw. So Tom Maniero um, constructs a certain co-chain complex associated to a quantum state and actually shows that entropy appears in the Euler characteristic of that co-chain complex. So he has, a, a, and a lot more, in fact. Um, he also gave a talk at this event and so his papers on the archive, homological tools for the quantum mechanic. And then of course, I mentioned this sort of information cohomology idea of Badeau and Benequin. In fact, their co-chain complex uh, even uses tools from Topos theory. So all of these perspectives, I think are kind of coming around in the past 10 years or so from you know, operads, category theory, polynomial, uh, polynomial functors, homological algebra, all of these ideas. Entropy is sort of the thing that's tying them all together but then one may wonder, um, you know, what's really the connection? What's going on here? And I think that that's an interesting question to ponder and hopefully we'll have more answers in the near future. Uh, so that's it um, for me. Thank you so much for your attention. Great, thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, we have time for questions. So feel free to raise your hand or just unmute if no one's talking. And I have a, a, a beginning of the question that you actually asked about what happens away from zero with derivations. If my question is, um, what, what examples do you have? I mean, if you build a derivation from the entropy function, then you get something that's constant on each simplex. But presumably there are a lot more derivations. Are there some good examples there to think about or is it just, there they are? And <laughs> yeah, no, it's a fantastic question. Um, I have no other examples to think about. Uh -huh. um, I don't, yeah, I, it's a little bit. Um, so, so let's see, is it within, let me make a really stupid conjecture. Might it be true that all derivations are on each simplex? I mean, that would certainly answer your question. I don't think that conjecture has any chance of being true, but is it, is it clearly false? Is it known to be false? What, what's going on there? Um, it's not known to be false, but I don't have enough information yet to even have an insight into that. Okay. Um, it's possible My, it could be very yeah. simple. I just My don't know. Just to say it, it's not known to be false, but nobody in their right mind would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but I may have just declared myself not to be in my right mind, so <laughs> never mind. Right. I'd really like a statement that says, you know, derivations of this operat are precisely the constant multiples of Shannon entropy. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 would, that would be a great theorem if it only cooperate by being true. Right, if it's true. And I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Um, so, you know, if okay. someone wants to okay, clarify. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you for the question. Thank you. I have a follow-up yeah. question that's even more elementary. Uh, I'm wondering, like, so maybe you can, is it possible to, like, perturb away from constant entropy? Just, like, put in a few, like, maybe think as an experimental physicist, put in a few degrees of freedom and see whether, like, there's only a finite number of constraints that work out, or is it like 
if in order for this to be that, then it sort of kicks something down the chain and there's actually an infinite number of things that you have to arrange and it becomes complicated to analyze. Or is it just a finite, is there like a, a finite dimensional family of things such each point of which it's a finite check whether it's a derivation? Right, so, so that's a, yeah, that's a great question. I think this idea of perturbing a little bit away from zero and seeing what happens, I think that's, okay, from my perspective, I think that's the way to go, at least to start to get some intuition for this. Um, I will say, I kind of started in that direction and then um, ended up picking picking up a different project. <laughs> so so I'm not sure. Um, I started by, I, this was actually a while ago, and I can't remember exactly where I got stuck. I think though, if one were to try to gain insight into this, at least just starting with a derivation and, you know, sticking in an arbitrary right, this gets you nowhere. I think this idea of moving away from zero, seeing how it behaves a little bit and getting in, intuition there, I think that's actually... Um, I think that's the next step. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. Do you know of any um, derivations on other operads? Oh. Or would it even, I mean, you said it's a bimodule. Is it a bimodule satisfying any particular properties? Um, well, let me answer your first question first. Sure. I don't have an example of a derivation on a different operand in mind. However, this definition that I have hinted at sort of in my paper and this bimodule idea, this actually appears in a paper by Martin Markle in the 1990s. I wanna say the early 1990s. Now he only considered linear operands. So operands where the operations are vector spaces and so it's just a matter of kind of generalizing that to the category of top. In that paper, um, uh, which I forget the name now, but I see that Jim Stashev is here. Hi, Jim. Maybe Jim can remind us of the title of the paper if we're interested. I know there he was considering derivations on linear operands, also with symmetric group action. It could be there, there's an example. I mean, I'm sure he was looking at it for a reason. I just don't remember now uh, at the time. Great, thanks. We have time for one more question. Well, let me ask a, a really tangential question. Um, you mentioned that um, there are extensions to, among other things, operates in the case of symmetric monoidal categories. And I didn't see much use of the symmetric aspect. So first question is, could one do this just in monoidal categories? And if that's too wild, as I tend to be, um, maybe braided monoidal categories or something of that sort, something less than symmetric. Yeah. So I think the answer is yes. I mentioned you can do this in any symmetric monoidal category. For this, of course, we don't need symmetry. And the reason for that really is because of Tom's original theorem. Here it is. Um, which sort of looks at FADIFs and says, you don't need this invariance under bijections. You don't have to worry about permuting these probabilities. So I didn't really need to say the word symmetric, but if one is interested in sort of taking these ideas and, and applying them into different categories or different operads, then at least there's hope to move in that direction because you can still make sense of it. But we just didn't need it here. I didn't need that level of generality, but, but I think one could, I think there is hope for that, yeah. All right, well, um, there is a question in the chat. Maybe I should read it. Um, uh, Yannick Vargas asks, looking at operads as monoids in the category of species with composition, is there a combinatorial way to describe the main result? And notes that maybe it's a vague question, but was hoping to, you, Vargas or Yannick was uh, hoping to uh, connect it with combinatorial species, if you have any ideas um, there. I'm not too familiar with them. Um, so I don't know, but that's a good question. Okay. I, I kind know. of noted in the chat that combinatorial species and polynomial functors have something in common. So maybe maybe that's a place to look. But well, um, if I remember correctly, in, in some of the literature on combinatorial species, including probably Joyal's original paper, there are pictures 
diagrams that look an awful lot like that picture that you've shown us from uh, Shannon's original paper, oh. figure six. I mean, the, the pictures are bigger because the, the trees have more than just two and three branching at each node, but it's the same idea. You, you have some branching associated to one species, and then at each of these nodes, further branching from some other species. Okay. So if you really believe in pictures, yeah, there's a connection. If you believe in actual things being written down, it gets a little <laughs> more difficult. Oh, great. Well, I'll have to look into that. Thank you. All right. Well, why don't we um, thank Titan again? So thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um,